Hello and welcome to the latest of our webcast interviews, a series uh, connected to the various party conferences. On this occasion, it's the SNP conference here in the city of Glasgow. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the leader of the SNP and the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Your speech at party conference this morning, of course, went down uh, rather well on the subject of Brexit and independence. We'll talk about that in a minute. We've got hundreds and hundreds of questions in. First Minister, I'm going to deal with some of the other topics okay. first, if, that, if that's okay. Question from David. He's a bit worried. He says he'll soon pay more income tax than he would in any other part of the UK. He's not very happy with that. Well, we're taking a reasonable approach to income tax, and we put forward our proposals in the Scottish election, and of course won that election convincingly. The Scottish Parliament is going to have power over income tax, so it's right that the Parliament and the government takes the decisions we think are right. The SNP government doesn't propose to raise the level of income tax. But we have said that we will not cut income tax in the form of mm -hmm. increasing the higher rate threshold in the way the Tory government at Westminster plans to do. Why do we think that's the wrong thing to do? Because at a time when public finances are constrained, uh, when we are seeking to invest as much as we can in health and education, uh, cutting the tax for some of the highest paid people in our country we don't think is the right thing to do at this time but we're not putting tax up for anybody uh, and yet the you know the Scottish economy is not exactly doing wonderfully mm -hmm. is it they grew by what was it 0.4 percent in the second quarter of this year crucially that's before the Brexit vote at that time it was 0.7 elsewhere don't you need to do things to stimulate the economy and, and arguably a tax yeah. rise doesn't do that well we're not increasing tax increasing nobody, the burden of taxation well, by, but, by but avoiding nobody, so if, if yeah. you're a higher rate taxpayer in Scotland just now you're not going to pay more tax than you do no, just now in but fact, the comparative because, burden of tax between be, north and south of the border sure, will be because high. the threshold is going to rise in line with inflation you'll actually pay slightly less in income tax than you do right now so your tax bill's not going up we're mm. simply not going to cut it substantially, which is and what do you, do you the think Tory that would be government a driver, would do. Is a driver to well, the economy when, when, when you consider, of course, we had this debate at length during the election. If, if you're a taxpayer in Scotland, your children get free university education, uh, your elderly relatives get free personal care if they have to go into a nursing home, uh, you don't pay for your prescription. So I think the balance of advantage, okay. if you live in Scotland compared to England, is actually quite a good one and a strong one. On, but on all of these decisions have to be balanced, and that's, of course, the responsibility of, of the government to make sure we strike the right balance. On, on that question of balance, Robert Jones says he's, he just gets into the higher rate, 40%. Mm -hmm. Brackett describes himself as a young professional, and he says that your tax plans are a tax on moderate and modest success. Yeah. I don't accept that. I mean, I'd, absolutely, we've got a job to do because our economy and you know the, the revenue that is then created through our economy, therefore our public services depend on this. So we want to support aspiration. We want to support those who work hard. This is a, a judgment about at a time when public finances are so constrained, is it right to cut the tax substantially of people who are on higher incomes? My judgment is that it's not. So as I say, we're not increasing income tax but we're equally not going to substantially reduce it at this stage. And that means that we do safeguard uh, revenue that we can invest in closing the attainment gap in our schools and improving our national health service and making sure those public services that everybody in our country relies on, regardless of where they are in the income yeah. spectrum, uh, that those public services are protected. Just, still briefly on tax, uh, land and buildings, transaction tax, replace stamp duty and Smith's worry, she says, uh, just, uh, properties above 325,000 sales are stuck. She's trying to sell a house. So, oh, gosh, <laughs> best of luck. Uh -huh. She says it's a lovely house, fair price just beyond 400,000. Mm -hmm. And she reckons that your tax, propo not proposals, the tax implementation of that new scheme mm. is causing problems to the market. Well, I understand if you're having difficulty selling a house, that's going to be a frustration you yeah. feel. The, the evidence doesn't really bear that out. We've, you know, there have been lots of assertions made that our tax proposals around LBTT wouldn't bring in the revenue we were projecting. That's turned out not to be the case. And what we did with LBTT is what we're seeking to do with all taxes is make it as progressive as possible. So we've lifted uh, more properties at the bottom end of, of the scale out of tax altogether. Now, why is that important? Because it helps people get onto the housing ladder for the first time. And if more people get onto the housing ladder, we free up more social housing for those who can't afford to buy. So we've made it more progressive. Now, I accept and I readily accept uh, with tax decisions, you're never going to please everybody all of the time. That's These are given, tough yeah. decisions and we weigh them very carefully. But we have to make sure we can raise the revenues to support the public services that people rely on and that's what our decisions are based on. But growing the economy is of fundamental importance and it's more important the more tax powers we have because there's a direct relationship between uh, what we raise in tax and what we can spend in our public services. That's why you know we are 
taking more small businesses out of the burden of paying rates. It's why I've announced a new mm. growth scheme to give more help to businesses that are looking to expand and export more, employ more people. The health of an economy is absolutely fundamental, which is why the topic we're going to come on to talk about Brexit is so yes. concerning. We'll get to that very shortly, I, I, I promise. You. And you, mm. Your speech on Saturday at the party conference will be perhaps more on domestic yes. issues, the economy, etc. A pile of questions on a pile of topics. Yeah. Uh, our, our old favourite here, fracking. Mm. Sally Page from Western Barbershire, thanks for your question. Sally says the key to dignity and satisfaction out of life is to have a job where possible and she reckons you're denying a generation this opportunity by maintaining a ban on fracking. She obviously believes it could be economically advantageous. Again, this is a, a very sensitive, controversial yeah. issue. Uh, I respect Sally's opinion. Uh, for every person who will express that opinion to me, there's one who there will, will express the, the view side, that yeah. this would be so devastating to our environment that we shouldn't do it. So we're taking a very careful approach to this. We've commissioned uh, a whole uh, series of impact studies looking at the impact on our environment, on the economy, on communities, on transport, on health. Those uh, studies will be published very soon. There will then be a substantial public consultation and we'll take a decision that is evidence-based. And I think that's on something as sensitive and controversial as this, that is the right way to do it. Are you it. inclined against it, though? It I, sounds I'm, from your, I'm going your to be, I'm language going, as if you're inclined against look, I, it. I recognise there are lots of very, very real concerns because you know what we've got, and this is perhaps what makes a country like Scotland different from the United yeah. States, for example. If fracking was to take place in Scotland, it would take place in the central belt of Scotland and in places where people live. This is not something that will be done in you know, vast tracts of the Highlands where nobody lives. It's in the central belt of Scotland. Now, I think that means we've got to be careful that we listen to the views of people who would live well, Wouldn't it matter that. if it was in the Highlands? It, no, of course it would matter if it was in the Highlands. I don't want anybody to suggest... I'm, I'm simply making the point that it's, it's in residential yeah. parts of the yeah. country. Um, there'd be a whole host of other reasons yes. why people would think it was a I bad understand. idea if it was happening in the Highlands. So we need to look at this very carefully and seriously and we cannot, uh, and you know, as First Minister I, I feel very strongly about this, I, I cannot simply cast aside the views of people that have to live with the impacts of, yeah. of these kinds of things. So w the view we're taking, I know there are people who would say hurry up and give it Get the go ahead it. or yeah. hurry up and ban it completely, yeah. but sometimes when you're in government you have to be careful and considered and cautious and look at the evidence and that's what we're doing. Thanks for that. Sorry to jump on to other questions. We've got hundreds of topics and then we have Brexit mm -hmm. as well. Welfare and social care, free personal care in Copeland, Aberdeen, Catherine Street. They just don't think it's working in needy cases. Lynn Copeland gives examples of people being denied the care they need by local authorities and having to wait in a queue because of financial constraints. Obviously, I, I don't know the particular circumstances of, of these cases. They're, they're, I get constituency cases in, in my own constituency, which is where we're sitting right now, of course. Um, all the time about uh, cases where the, the, the system is not working for yes. people. So I, I recognise that, that, that that will be the case and we've got to do better. I think free personal care is a, a policy, is the right one, and I think that one is working well and I think it's one we should safeguard. We've recognised and we, we, we've done something that you know every previous administration in the Scottish Parliament ducked, and that is integrate health and social care services, which has been a difficult, challenging thing mm -hmm. to do. But it is designed Have to make you, though, sure. Have you it really works? Yes. In practice? Well, it's, it's in its early days, okay. but yes, it is working, and that is bringing budgets together. It's bringing teams of people together, and it's trying to get away from what has been a perennial problem, which is people falling between the gaps and you know between healthcare and, and social care and trying to make sure that we have a system in place that is meeting the needs of individuals. So I, I accept there's work still to do, but I think we're going in the right direction. Of course, we're trying to get more money yeah. out of the acute health service into social care services as well. Let's do a couple more topics before we move to independence. Named person, um, folk are still not very happy with this. Leslie Scott, Mark Miller uh, querying the money spent in it. Leslie Scott in Perth. She says, try and regain the, the trust and faith of the Scottish people lost to this debacle by scrapping the deeply disliked named person scheme once and for all. You accept it's had some opposition and difficulties? I certainly accept it's had opposition. I, ah, I think I'd be yeah. denying reality okay. if I, I tried not to yeah. uh, accept that. And you know, clearly it had uh, a challenge in the courts and in yeah. the Supreme Court, a, a particular aspect of the policy. It's important to recognise that the Supreme Court didn't say the policy was illegal or that it mm. breached human rights. In fact, it said it was a, a benign attempt to, to help protect children. Uh, but there was a, a particular concern uh, upheld in the Supreme Court Supreme Court around the data sharing uh, aspects of this. So John Swinney, who's the minister responsible, is looking at that just now. And we're determined to try, as we progress with this policy, which we're determined to do because it is about trying to protect children, but we're determined to try to do that in a way that brings people together and addresses people's concerns as uh, we go. Uh, one, one for us, uh, given where we're sitting. Um, Paul Hare, Andrew Armstrong, Tom Allen, questions in about the BBC. They think there's a unionist 
uh, bias in the BBC. And Andrew Armstrong in particular says, how do we take control of the BBC in Scotland in order to ensure the next referendum does not suffer from the same well, issue? No politician wherever they sit in the political spectrum, should control the media. We oh, have an right. independent media, and whether that's the BBC or STV or newspapers, the importance of an independent, strong, robust media is vital. I don't like everything that the media reports, uh, apart from yourself, Brian, obviously, which is always impeccable, but you know that's the role of the media, to hold people like me to account. There are issues and uh, about the BBC, about the amount of... The, the, the resources of the, the BBC that are invested with the in Scotland the other week in Parliament, uh, about yeah. the, the extent to which the BBC doesn't reflect one or other political view but reflects the reality of life in Scotland. And these are issues I think the BBC, as its new charter uh, is implemented and as the debate, for example, around a Scottish Six continues, these are issues that the BBC very much, I think, has to address. Let's, let's take another one that was raised. Thanks for the questions on pensions and pensioners, particularly mm. on what's called the WASPy yeah. campaign about those women born in the 50s who expected a pension at a certain age Age and now getting it, what, up to six years mm. or so later? I mean, just a pile of questions in about that. Say, I, I can you do that. anything, basically? Well, we're trying very hard to, to make the case. Pensions are a reserve matter. Yes, They're indeed. not within I our area of responsibility. Entirely, yeah. But the way these women are being treated is absolutely disgraceful. You know, these are women who paid into uh, pensions expecting a certain entitlement and, you know, I've had some of that entitlement completely taken away from them. So, you know, in fact, uh, one of the, the, the rather nice ironies is it's our youngest MP, Mary Black, who's leading this charge in the House of Commons. Um, it's wrong and, you know, it wouldn't take a whole lot of money for the UK government to fix it and I hope they do the right thing because these women have been done a real disservice. Thank you for that. As billed, let's move to Brexit and independence, the subject of your speech this morning. Hundreds of questions in, in on the this. Bill Ferguson, let's pick his. He says, what makes you think you could call another referendum, independence referendum, when you said the one in 2014 was for a generation? Well, look, in 2014, Scotland voted for a UK that was going to be in the European Union and that had, uh, according to many of the people who voted, no you know, economic stability and a louder voice in the world. These, these were reasons I didn't agree with at the time. But these are the reasons many people who voted no uh, did so. That UK is not the one that we're facing the prospect of. The UK right now, because of the Brexit vote, I think is is heading towards a cliff edge. And I don't want Scotland to be taken over that cliff edge uh, as well. So what I've said, and I said it the morning after the referendum, is that I want to examine every option that is there to try to protect Scotland's interests, because our interests, economy, jobs, trade, investment, uh, our place in the world, all of these things are on the line. I want to try to protect that and give effect to how people in Scotland voted. So mm -hmm. I've set out today in, in my opening speech to the conference some very clear uh, intentions in terms of how the SNP will uh, take things forward. We'll vote against the Brexit bill in the mm -hmm. House of Commons because Scotland didn't vote for that. We'll seek to build a coalition in the House of Commons to... Uh, to protect the UK as a whole. It's the second bit that's more important, isn't it? Because the bill itself is about repatriating uh, sure. try powers. It's, it's, it's the Brexit negotiations that you need to get a handle on if you're going well, to, to try bring to protect about your the UK change. against a hard Brexit. Because yeah. you know the, the UK, not just Scotland. Well, you are well, still I, working I would, through the UK conduit. I, I would really like to see the, the UK not go over this cliff edge okay. as well, because you know the UK government is now talking not just about taking the UK out of the EU, but taking it out of the single market. That was never what was envisaged, I don't think, in the referendum campaign, and it will have disastrous consequences. Now, I'd like to see the UK as a whole avoid that. If the UK as a whole can or won't avoid that, we'll put forward proposals that would, with Scotland within the UK, yeah. seek to Let, have Scotland avoid that. Let's take those in but, order. How, how, how can you protect, as you would describe it, Britain's exit from the European single market? How exactly can you, can you well, do that? I, I don't think there's a majority in the House of Commons to take the UK out of the single market. I think we've started to see this week that with Labour, the Liberals, the SNP, moderate Tories, then there are more people against removal from the single market than there are in the House of Commons in favour of that. So, well, what, what would exit from the European Union mean if it isn't exit from the single market, which is the core of the European well, Union? Well, you know, countries like Norway are not in the European Union, but they're in the single market. Now, you know, leave campaign and the referendum... Pay money without any, any, well, any influence upon the, the but, single but, market rules. But what you're paying money for... Now, don't get me wrong, I think it's a, a less good okay. uh, option than staying in the EU because one of yeah. the, the problems with it is you don't influence the rules and regulations that you then have to live by. But, you know, in the referendum campaign, I, I vividly remember 
politicians like Boris Johnson saying leaving the EU doesn't mean we leave the single doesn't market. Saying things mean, like, yeah. you know, the only good thing about the EU is the common market, the single market. So, you know, let's be under no illusions that the impact on jobs, on the economy, on trade, investment of coming out of the single market will be absolutely disastrous. To be clear, and I don't want to be to clear you, you, need, you need there to be a vote, a, a, a preparatory vote for the, for the Brexit negotiations in the House of Commons, and you then need to add well, your, let, your party let's support. Let's unpack this a little bit. There, yeah. there, there should be. I yeah. think a vote in the House of Commons before okay. Article 50 is triggered. That has been argued over in the High Court in England UK government today. says that that would trump well, the, the wishes of the people well, as expressed in a referendum. You know, I, I, the irony of this is, 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 is gobsmacking in my view. You know, we had a, a Leave campaign that was all about bringing back control and restoring sovereignty to the House of Commons. And now you've got people saying that the House of Commons should have no say uh -huh. in the negotiating strategy That would be the route. The you, you get a well, vote in the Commons. Yeah, I've got that. The I think there should be a vote before triggering Article 50. Uh -huh. The courts may insist on it. We don't know yet. It's being discussed courts, today. Courts yeah. may insist on primary legislation yeah. before that because that's what the court action is focusing on. But even if there is not, the, the Brexit bill, the, the great repeal bill that, that Theresa May uh, announced, that is not just about bringing all the laws and regulations yes. into UK law. That firstly is about repealing the European Communities Act, yes. the act that took us in. So act, yeah. if at that time it is clear that a hard Brexit is on the cards, I think people who are against a hard Brexit in the House of Commons should vote against that okay. and stop it happening. Uh, uh, if, if that route does not, if that route for whatever is a uh, reason is not pursued, either the, the UK government goes ahead and uses royal prerogative to, to trigger Article 50, goes ahead with negotiations and, and within yeah. two years Britain is out of the... You are saying that there would then be a referendum on well, Scottish look, independence. There's a bit in the middle before... Okay. I, I, if, if the UK as a whole can't be kept in the single market, ah. I think there's still a case for Scotland staying in the single market. Within the UK? Uh, still within the UK. Now, okay. would that be simple? Would that be straightforward? No, but I think there's a way that could be done. And over the next few weeks, as part of the yeah. negotiations to develop the negotiating strategy, which I'm determined the Scottish Government will be part of, we'll put forward proposals. And that could that be what? That Using about. the European free trade area? Well, some... we'll, we'll set out that proposal okay. in due course. I'm not going to get into the detail of that today, but that is another way in which I'm honouring this commitment I made to examine all options. But, you know, yes, ultimately... If the prospect here is Scotland being taken over that cliff edge with the rest of the UK, being part of a UK that wasn't the UK we thought we were voting for in 2014, then yes, the ability for Scotland to decide again whether it wants to take a different path should be protected. And to protect that position, we have to take the steps to get legislation why, underway. Why don't you, as Colin, Colin McLeod, thanks for your question, Colin, he says, just call the referendum now. He says you can set the detailed date later, depending on the Brexit negotiations are going. But the important thing at this juncture is to make a definite commitment to hold no, the referendum. No, I, I, You're not making a definite commitment well, to hold an earlier well, referendum, I'm, I'm, are you? I'm trying to do what I think is right for the country. And I, okay. I said in, in my speech, and it's true, you know, every single day, and Colin here is... It's just an illustration of it, and Another I don't mean one. this in, no. in any way. He says you can set the date later. He's, he's yeah, a, a but, novel. But, yeah, yeah. but, you know, I get people every day saying, hurry up, and then I get people every day saying, slow who, who, down. Who did you have in I mind? Get, you I, you I, said I don't someone, have anybody in mind. Someone. Several could it, people. Could, could it be a predecessor Not leader, an immediate predecessor Not leader, perhaps? Uh, I, I get several it, people. But the point is, I know there are different opinions here. I'm the first minister of, of the country. I'm not just leader of the SNP. I'm the first yeah. minister of the country. And I've got to act in a way that I think is right for the country. Um, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, but, you know, make no mistake, if what we are facing the prospect of is being, you know, shackled to a UK that's going over that cliff edge, that is coming out of the single market, that is hemorrhaging jobs and opportunities and investment, that's turning in on itself, that's, you know, indulging in xenophobia about foreigners. Yeah. Scotland's got, I think, the right to decide whether it wants to do that or whether it wants to take a different path. When you said some, someone or some people are, are OK, fair enough, some people are calling for an instant referendum, some people are saying, Kakani, you said, welcome to my world. Let's step into your world for a second. You must be torn on this question, um, because if you thought you'd win, you'd call it tomorrow. Look, I'm, I'm not... I'm not torn. I'm, I'm going to be guided by what I think is, is right. And, and ultimately, of course, the Scottish Parliament would have to but, pass But you haven't decided yet definitely to hold a referendum, Look, I, have you? I, you're, I, you're not there I have, yet. I've always, not there yet. I've always believed Scotland will become an independent country. So, you know, and to that extent, there will be another referendum at yeah. some point. We're talking now specifically in this context of the EU Brexit. referendum. Yeah. And I made a promise on the morning after that referendum that I would examine all options. And that's what we're doing. But that is driven by what's best to protect Scotland's interests. And I, I keep coming back to this point because I think this is changing now, but there's been an extent in the weeks immediately after the referendum to talk about Brexit in sort of abstract 
terms as if it doesn't affect anybody. It's going yeah. to have a real effect on people. We see it with the plunging value of the pound that's going to send prices up. And you think that's permanent, not, not temporary? No? Well, I, I think if, if the UK is coming out of the single market, then it's certainly not temporary in a short-term basis. I think that the damage, and it's not just me saying this, every most economic commentators are saying this, the damage to the UK economy is going to be deep and it's going to be at long term. And, you know, I think Scotland, if we get to that point where that's the prospect we face, then I would owe it to people in Scotland to give them the chance to choose. Do they want that or do they want something different? What's the, I mean, you, you hear the music, you hear the tone from the Prime Minister. It seems unlikely well, that, that, see. that they're going to make the concessions that you, you want. Well, you know, let's see. She came to Butte House a couple of days after becoming Prime Minister okay. and, and gave me a commitment that we would be listened to. What's, what, um, where, where are we? Is it 50-50, 80-20 well, in favour of, of, of a referendum? Out. Oh, well, I'm not going to... I know you would like me to do that. I'm not going to put percentages okay. on it like right, that. Right. But, you know, I, I was sending a pretty serious message to the Prime Minister Indeed. today. We didn't choose to be in this position we're in just now. Scotland didn't choose to be at the on the brink of being taken out of the European Union against yeah. our will. Theresa May's party has put us here. They're the ones who say they value the UK... So the onus is on them to show Scotland that the UK can work for our interests, not that it is uh, inevitably the case that it's going to damage our interests. So the ball very much is in the Prime Minister's court just now. You, you, you've spoken in the past about, since the Brexit referendum, about duty, quite struck by going through your speeches, how often that comes up. You, talk of, you talked of your, your duty to respond to the Brexit vote in Scotland's interest. You talked in another context about your duty to build and maintain mm -hmm. Consensus, given that the situation has changed, that Scotland is no longer facing membership mm. of the European Union, is, is that perhaps another aspect? Is there a duty, perhaps, to put that revised prospect to the Scottish people? I, I is, that, is that something that weighs with you? It does. Um, and we're not here yet because I set out in my speech this morning different steps that we can still explore to protect Scotland. But if we get to the point where it is a stark choice, that we stay part of the UK, knowing that that is going to damage our economy, damage our standing in the world, turn us into the kind of country that I don't think people want to be, or we take a different path to, to protect the open, progressive, uh, internationalist Scotland that I think most people want us to be, then at that point, yes, perhaps there is a duty to allow people to make that choice. And, you know, that's, that's quite important because it's not the choice we faced in 2014. Um, you know, the, the UK that we voted to stay in in 2014 is not the UK that potentially will exist as a result of the Brexit vote. So, you know, that material change of circumstances that I've talked about previously, uh, that's happened. I've hogged it a little bit. Let's try a few more questions from the viewers, listeners and readers. Many thanks. Guy Spurway says, you seem un so worried about the possibility of leaving the European single market, but totally unconcerned by the prospect of an independent Scotland leaving the single market that is the Union of the United Kingdom. Well, I, I think that's a false choice with respect, and it's one of the scares that we will no doubt hear repeatedly from uh, the UK government and, and the Conservatives and, and Labour, those who were on the no side before. But, you know, what I would say to people about this is listen to what the UK government are saying about Ireland at the moment, where, you know, David Davis, Theresa May have been at great pains to go to Ireland and say you don't have to choose between remaining part of the European Union and retaining your links with the UK. We can find a way of avoiding a border. We can find a yeah. way of avoiding an interruption to trade between Ireland and the UK. Now, I'd simply say if, if that's possible for Ireland, then why on earth would that not be possible for Scotland So you could as be well? talking about some sort of variable settlement within these islands that would allow Absolutely. Scotland to, to, do a, 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 to maintain membership of the single market through perhaps uh, the, the Norwegian style We, after, we yeah. are now in uncharted and you would territory. And you would need the caveat, you, you would need, you would need the, 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 the fiat of, of the UK to do that, wouldn't you? Or the support if, of the if UK. If we're doing it within the UK, then, as I yeah, said yes. today, we would want that yes. to be part of their Article 50 negotiation. But, yes. you know, we, we've been put into this situation. There are no rules for what happens now. I think we're seeing that pretty okay, clearly. That's good. There's a, a blank sheet of paper, uh, and I'm not sure anybody in the UK government has the first clue what to write on that piece of paper, which is why you know, we're trying to think about what do we write on that? How do we create something here that makes the best of a situation we didn't choose to be in? Now, we're trying to do that in good faith, but you know, whether we can succeed or not with that UK-wide solution will depend uh, as much on the attitude of Theresa May as it does on what I put Here's forward. a couple of questions on that other topic. A topic I have heard you mention a number of times. Nikita, I can't quite get the second name, it looks like Romanos, um, it says was 13 year old born in Latvia into a Russian family wondering about connections with other mm. European countries very precise question from Giancarlo Oppo he says he teaches at the University of Strathclyde always felt welcome in Scotland family is Scottish 
double UK mm. and Italian uh, roots, if you like. He says, for the first time in 27 years, I feel uneasy to be in the UK as mm. a result of Brexit. That horrifies me. And I, of all the, the things that worry me around the, the referendum, that's the one that most deeply uh, horrifies me. This is a, an open, welcoming country. And I'm not just talking about Scotland. I think to its credit, the UK has yeah. been like that. And the idea that we now have a culture where people from other countries don't feel welcome. And, and in some cases, and I, I don't say this lightly, don't feel as safe as they once did is absolutely horrible. Um, and that's, I guess it gets to the heart of what we were talking about a moment ago about the choice. I don't want Scotland to be a closed, inward-looking, insular country where we, we close our borders and say we don't want people, apart from the fact that it would be bad for our economy. It's not the kind of society I want us to be. Um, and that comes back to this choice. Uh, you know, we can't be forced down that yeah. road. Um, and I desperately want to find a way of stopping that and maintaining the values that are so important to a us. A couple of technical points. I'm always obsessed with technical points, but they tend to matter yeah. in, in politics. If we are to have a second independence referendum, we've talked about Article 50 triggering mm. the, the European Union negotiations. Would there have to be a Section 30 transfer of power uh, uh, from, from the UK government to, I, to I've, Scotland? I've, I've always uh, as there was in 2014. operated on the assumption that it would, if there was another referendum, it would be on the same basis as the, the one before in terms of the legal underpinning yes. of it. And, that um, and that's always been my assumption that we had that Section 30 transfer the last time. I've always assumed we'd be doing it the same What if cooperation way. were withheld well, by the know, UK government? Well, if we get to that point, we get to that point. I uh -huh. think it would be inconceivable, given that the Tories have put us in this position, if the Scottish Parliament decided, and the Scottish Parliament, it's not just I can yes. decide when to propose a referendum, yes. it's the Scottish Parliament, the democratically elected Parliament of our country that has to pass that legislation. If the Scottish Parliament decided that it was the right thing to protect Scotland's interest to have a referendum in these circumstances and the Tories tried to block it, I think that would be absolutely inconceivable Technical and outrageous. Point, forgive me that, sorry I interrupted you. Technical point on timing. Mm. Um, if it's to influence the Brexit outcome, if the trigger is in spring 2017, that means Brexit is two years later unless there is unanimous agreement of the other 27 countries to extend that. That means 2019 is Brexit, means to get in ahead of that. 2017 presumably is too early to hold a referendum. This is, this is a, a, an awesome attempt here to get me to name a date. Uh, give, me a, give me a break here, First Minister. 2017 <laughs> is, 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 is too early because you wouldn't know the shape, the emerging shape of Brexit. I'm serious about that. You, mm. you, to, you, to, to put it against Brexit, mm. you'd have to know what Brexit is, and we certainly don't know what mm. that is at the moment. Mm. That would point more likely 18 than 17. I, I think all of what you said there is, is, you know, is, is fine logic. I, I'm not going to get into okay. the position of naming dates because, you know, as I've just said to but the... There was a piece earlier this week suggesting you could, you could, you could miss out, you could, you could be too I saw late. that piece. I, I, yeah. I didn't, I mean, didn't a piece actually by a very good and respected academic Indeed. whose views yeah. I, I do take seriously, but I didn't think that that particular piece uh, was, well, it wasn't one I agreed with. Where, where, where do you think we're, we're heading in, in, in that case? You, you, you are serious about trying to negotiate with the, yeah. the UK the, the government? First, the first meeting uh, of the, the joint ministerial committee that is being established to involve the devolved administrations in yeah. the Article 50 negotiation takes place in London a week on Monday. I'll be at that with Mike Russell, the yeah. minister I've appointed to lead these negotiations. And I guess at that point we'll get a, a sense of how serious the UK government is about involving us and listening to what we say. And I, I'll repeat what I said in my speech earlier on, the ball's in their court. You know, I, I'm saying, I'm here, I'm trying to see if we can find a way that effectively squares this circle. Scotland didn't vote for this. Uh, we want to stay in the single market, so can we square this circle? Um, and I would hope the UK government will meet me halfway and try to find that. A question from, from, from uh, Joy Fraser. How are you going to convince people to vote for independence? People who want it out of the European Union. That's yeah. quite an intriguing conundrum. Yeah. It could, there could be a mm -hmm. trigger to hold yeah. a referendum, but there could be folk that say, hang on a second, you've got to take us back yeah. into Brussels. No, I, I, with a million of, of, of There were a million people in yeah. Scotland who voted to leave, and... Aside from the issue about a referendum, I've got a duty to, to listen and understand why people voted to leave and, and respond to that. I think I would say two things to people who, who voted in that way in the context of, of independence. Yeah. First is, you know, not everybody, but I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of people who voted to leave looking at the antics of Boris Johnson and David Davis right now. So you're back to this point the about that's not what the they voted for. This is, yeah. It's not a Brexit anymore, it's a Tory Brexit and, and wondering, is that what I voted for? But secondly... But you have to be aware, you're aware of this as an course, issue, it's a possible course. concern but to The you, second yeah. point is about who decides these things. You yeah. know, we can all have disagreements about in or out of the UK, in or out of the EU, about all sorts of things, but fundamentally who decides? Is it right that Scotland's voice in this gets completely cast aside? Um, and that's a kind of fundamental issue. The, the, the EU campaign was, from the Leave side, was all about bringing back control. You know, 
as things stand just now, it's taking control away from Scotland because we voted to stay in and yet risk being taken out completely against our will. There's a fundamental democratic argument here. Now, a final mischievous question. There's an election taking place elsewhere across the pond in oh, the United noticed. States of America. Um, Ian Richmond from Angus wants to know, if Donald Trump becomes president, will you be inviting him to Butte House? Well, I hope, you know, it, it, it's usually not politic for the leader of one government to comment on the election yeah. of another country, but I'm going to break that protocol. I really hope and expect that the people of America will not elect Donald Trump as, as president. Um, you know, in, in the EU referendum campaign, a lot of the real horror of Brexit was hidden from people, I think. With Donald Trump, we see the full horror of, of what that would mean. So I would be delighted, absolutely delighted. It's the first woman first minister of Scotland to invite uh, the first woman president of the United States to Butte House if and when uh, President Hillary Clinton is elected. Diplomatically handled, unless, of course, the outcome goes the other well, way. First Minister, see. thank you very much indeed for, for joining me, and thank you very much for the, discussing all the elements, particularly the Brexit and independence uh, issues. Thanks again. And that's uh, the close of our webcast here from me, Brian Taylor, to the New.